Okay, welcome everybody. It's Simon Rosenberg here at NDN for one of our uh, regular conversations with thought leaders, people doing interesting and innovative things that I thought our community would be interested in hearing about. Uh, back is our most frequent contributor to these discussions, our dear friend Rob Shapiro, who comes on every few months to give us an update on the uh, economy and his sense of where things are. Rob has just written a really wonderful piece in Washington Monthly called Yes, Americans Are Better Off Under Biden. And I asked him to come and discuss that really wonderful article. Um, and when he's done, it'll take about 10, 12 minutes. I'll say a few things and then we'll open it up for what will be a robust and fun conversation. So Rob, my dear friend of 30 years, it's hard to believe, um, who among other things was a uh, Undersecretary of Commerce for Economic Affairs under Bill Clinton. He was the primary architect of the Clinton Economic Plan in 1992 and 93, and just a, a very thoughtful uh, economist who is capable uh, from time to time speaking in plain English so we can all understand. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons I love Rob. So Rob, uh, take it away. Thank you, Simon, my old friend. Um, at the close of the 1980 presidential campaign, Ronald Reagan, closed his debate, the only debate he and Carter had. And he closed that debate by urging Americans to ask themselves if they were better off under Carter. Now, like a good prosecutor, he knew the answer before he asked the question, because inflation and un unemployment were both very high and still rising. Um, well, why aren't Republicans asking that question today? of Biden? Well, they're not because they know the answer too. The data show that based on jobs, on incomes, on wealth, on poverty, on health coverage, Americans are better off today than when Biden took office and much better off than just before the pandemic. Now, nobody can argue with Biden's record on jobs. More than 9.7 million unemployed people found jobs over the last 19 months. The unemployment rate fell from 6.4% to 3.5%. Now it's now 3.7%, but that's because labor participation rates are rising again. So the base that you measure the unemployment rate is bigger. Now, but whether, whether people are better off when it comes to incomes is more complicated. Um, because of the way the pandemic disrupted the economy. GDP collapsed in 2020 and unemployment soared, followed by massive spending that extended into 2021 and helped the economy recover. But the widespread supply problems on top of that spending, especially issues with energy, ignited inflation. So while fast rising employment was producing a record 15% surge in total wage and salary income since Biden took office, the question remains, how much has inflation eaten away at those gains? The answer is that wages and salaries have kept pace with inflation since Biden became president. And compared to just before the pandemic, most Americans' wages and salaries are considerably higher. Now, the Bureau of Economic Analysis has the best data on the nation's earnings, and it reports that before inflation, uh, all Americans earned about $11.4 trillion in wages and salaries um, at an annual rate in June 2022. Um, that's 15% higher than in January 2021. And 16.6% .6 higher than in February 2020, just before the pandemic. But we have to take account of inflation's impact on that wage and salary income. And we do that by applying the BEA's deflator for personal expenditures, which is for virtually all economists, a better uh, inflation measure than the consumer price index. And when we use that deflator to raise the original, to, to put the wage and salary income um, in June 2022 dollars, um, 
uh, it comes to 10.7 trillion uh, for January 2021 and 10.7 trillion for February 2020. Now that's a lot of numbers. You don't have to remember any of them, uh, except to know that we then divided all those results by the number of people earning wages and salaries on each day. So we just took the total wage and salary income. We adjusted it for inflation using the deflator. And then we divided that by the number of people earning wages and salaries. Um, and the math shows that in current dollars, the average working American earned $74,643 in wages and salaries in June, 2022. That compares to $74,624 in January, 2021. Virtually the same thing, a difference, you know, were uh, $19 higher. <laughs> Uh, than, uh, than, than at the beginning of the Biden term. And it compares to about 70,000 in February, 2020. So comparing to just before the pandemic, um, we're about $4,300 higher after inflation in wage and average wage and salary income. So even with 9.5 million more people working. The average working person earned as much in June after inflation as when Biden took office, uh, and 6.2% more than just before the pandemic. And let me say, you know, we have some very recent data. Most recent data confirm this. Over the last two months, July and August, Real weekly earnings rose, that is after inflation, rose by nearly a percentage point, by eight tenths of a percent in over two months. So the question, so the answer to Reagan's question is yes on wages and salaries, as well as jobs, which is frankly pretty remarkable given the pandemic's terrible distortions and disruptions to employment and prices. Americans are also a lot wealthier under Biden than the Democrats. The pandemic and the subsequent job boom were largely responsible because the government sent out checks to most hot households and that spurred higher saving, which goes into wealth, while the increased spending helped drive up employment. The result, according to the Federal Reserve, is that after inflation, the net assets of Americans expanded by nearly $2 trillion from the time Biden took office to the first quarter of this year. And that excludes the wealth gains by the top 1%. We set them aside, mainly because their assets are very hard to measure. Wealthy people's assets are hard to measure. So the norm is you look at 99% if you're looking for these kinds of trends. So moreover, <laughs> um, even setting aside you know, the top 1%, the period breaks the general rule of the rich getting richer because the fastest growth in people's assets occurred among lower and moderate income households. From the first quarter of 2021 to the first quarter of 2022, the inflation adjusted wealth of households in the lowest income quintile, that's the lowest one fifth of households, increased 15%, jumped 15%. In the second quintile, it jumped 6%. In the third quintile, which is right in the center, um, it jumped 4%. And in the fourth quintile, it jumped 3%. And in the top quintile, not including the top 1%, it increased less than 1%. So we have an inversion of what we're used to seeing. And that is people with the least assets made the greatest gains in wealth 
over this period. On top of all that, the poverty rate under Biden fell from 16.1% in December 2020, just before he took office, to 14.5% in July 2022. And that decline in poverty reflects the, the jobs boom, not the COVID relief payments. And we know that because we can figure out the poverty rate excluding all those payments. And excluding those payments, the poverty rate fell from 17.4% to 15.5%. It's the same story on healthcare coverage. From late 2020 to early 2022, the percentage of uninsured short Americans fell from 14.5% to 11.8% among adults, and from 6.4% to 3.7% among children. Those are both record low levels uh, of uninsured. Now, there's still inflation and the slowdown triggered by the Fed's response to the inflation. Um, but, but for the pandemic and the policies required to adjust, adjust it, inflation would be modest today. Of course, but for the inflation and but for the inflation, Biden would have one of the best records so far of any post-war president on the economy. Of course, but for the pandemic, Biden also might not be president today. Um, and we can imagine, so let's, let's think about that for a second. We can imagine what Trump would say if he had record job creation, record low poverty, record high health insurance coverage, Rapid gains in wealth from the bottom from uh, uh, the bottom up, and wage and salary gains that kept up with unexpected inflation. The message that Donald Trump would carry to the country with that record is a message that should be a critical part of every Democrat's campaign. This is an economic record to run on. Um, Rob, that was a great summary of complicated data. <laughs> and um, I also would, I just want to make one comment and then I'm going to open it up for, for questions is that I, you know, when you look at what Rob said, I mean, if you, which is within the last few months, we've seen the lowest poverty rate ever recorded, the lowest uninsured rate ever recorded, the lowest unemployment rate ever in a peacetime uh, economy since World War II. We've seen incredibly high wage, nominal wage gains. We are seeing record number of new businesses started every month. We're running about two times the norm of the last you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, we've now also made these extraordinary investments in infrastructure, uh, microchip manufacturing, clean energy, um, healthcare that are gonna drive economic growth and prosperity for potentially a generation. Um, right now, the American economy is more dynamic, more robust, stronger than it potentially has been in our entire lifetime. And, you know, when you look at these measures, and we have to somehow figure out, I think, as Democrats, a way of being able to say, we've done all these good things, and inflation is too high, right? It isn't that these all these good things didn't happen, right? I mean, the way the economic conversation is in the United States right now We've done all these amazing things, record poverty, record uninsured, lowest peacetime unemployment rate, huge numbers of new business formation, which we know is unbelievably important for future job growth, by the way, right? Super important as a foundational. It makes the base wider, right, for everybody. All these things have happened. And the way the, the language works is that, but inflation is too high. And what I want to argue to everyone here is that we have to be able to say and, not but. Because what's happened is that the but then negates all the other things that happened before. And it's become sort of like a Jedi mind trick in American politics where, you know, you can do all this extraordinary stuff. You could have come all this distance that we've traveled, as Rob said, and somehow it gets negated down into nothing. And the reason I wanted to conduct this conversation today um, was that, 
you know, despite everything Rob just told you, and despite the fact that in all the other research that we put out that, you know, we know that Biden has created five times as many jobs in his presidency so far as the last three Republican presidents combined. We know that the job creation rate per month is running 50 times higher under Biden than it was under the last three Republican presidents combined. We know that since 1989 and this new age of globalization began, that America's created 45 million jobs, 43 million of those jobs, 96% have been created under Democratic presidents. And despite all of this, Republicans have a 10 to 15 point advantage on the economy going into the final few weeks of the election. And part of the reason I wanted to bring Rob here together today is that we simply have to make closing that gap a major priority. It's the Achilles heel for us as we in, enter into the home stretch, in my view. And I'm putting a political overlay on Rob's, you know, non, you know, uh, nonpartisan analysis of the data. Um, but this, these matters really, it, this stuff really matters. And Democrats have to learn, in my view, how to win the economic argument with the Republicans, be more proud of our achievements. Um, and sell this stuff like crazy, not just in this election, but for the coming elections. Because it's my view as a political professional that we are gonna, we're not gonna get to where we wanna get to in elections and in governing unless we get more credit for the good things that we've done. And and because it's creating a lower ceiling for us than it needs to be. And Rob has done yeoman's work over the last six to nine months in helping interpret the data and, and explain you know, why we should be excited and proud of the progress that we've made during unbelievably difficult circumstances, right, that we've inherited. And um, and so that's it, those are my comments. Let's, we're gonna get a lot of questions. You know, all of you are Zoom warriors now, you know, there's two ways to engage. You can either put a Q&A into the box or you can raise your hand. Uh, and Laura asks an important question which I'm really glad you asked this question because we got there's a couple obvious things here, uh, which is, Rob, how do you explain the disconnect between the facts and the data that you just shared and how many people don't feel that they're better off? Well, um, I think when, when people are asked the question, um, do you feel better off economically? They don't only answer through their what's what's happening economically. They also they answer through their feelings about their lives. And the pandemic still um, imposes a pall over everyone, I think. But the main reason is uh, I think there are two reasons actually. Um, inflation. Uh, people have particularly up to the last couple of months, confronted inflation on a really daily basis, in particular at the gas pump and at uh, the supermarket. Um, the inflation at the gas pump has come down considerably. Um, the inflation in, um, uh, at the supermarket has not come down in, uh, as much. And so people still feel some of that. Um, I will say that, you know, um, inflation is, is what usually happens when you have a very, very strong economy. Um, not always, but it usually comes. Um, so I think people are uh, um, a little confused. Um, they, they know they've got jobs. They know that not only that they have jobs, but that they could quit their jobs and find new jobs, which is, you know, this large number of uh, people who resign from their jobs, you know, the so-called great resignation. Uh, that comes from confidence that you can find a new job. Um, but beyond that, you know, economists <laughs> aren't great psychologists, so they're not great political psychologists. So um, uh, I'd really like to hear what Simon thinks. Yeah, I mean, look, there is so much information distortion. <clears throat> I mean, I agree with everything Rob said. So let me just stipulate that, you know, inflation matters, right? People are seeing the, you know, the pump, you know, the pump prices going way up. And 
Um, and what we've seen is as in, you know gas prices have come down, people's understanding, you know, people's feelings about the economy have gotten much better. I mean, there's been a change, right? And Biden's approval rating has come way up. I mean, that we're going through a change in people's understanding of the economy. And even on questions of anticipated inflation, <clears throat> people's estimates of what inflation will be is very low, right? So we haven't connected, we haven't gone into that wage price psychological spiral, right? That every, that uh, economists and the Fed are so worried about. I mean, people actually have very low expectations of future inflation because most people, by the way, in polling, blame inflation, not on Joe Biden, and, but on the thing that largely caused it, which was COVID and supply chain disruptions and the Ukrainian war, and to some degree, government policies. But at the end of the day, I think we have to be able to stand behind the choices we made um, and that it was far better as we learned in the last recession to, you know, during a time of not just a normal economic dip, right? We were, we had no idea what was gonna happen with COVID. We had no idea with how long this was gonna last. We had no idea the degree to which this was gonna create long-term economic disruption and dislocation. And so being aggressive as Biden was about addressing the under, you know, to get us out of recession into recovery was the right choice. It was the right choice and we have to stand by it. And, and as we went through as part of what we're trying to give you is more of the ammunition to say, look, we made a tough call. Things were really bad, right? And we did the right thing and look at where we are. We're doing better than virtually any other, you know, um, industrialized nation in the world uh, right now coming out of COVID. And yes, and inflation's too high. And yes, inflation's a global phenomenon. And yes, that, you know, we have to, uh, continue to be vigilant about what we what we want now is to move from a strong recovery to a, an ex economic expansion, to a Biden expansion, to go from Biden recovery to Biden expansion, and to have you know what's called a soft landing. This is going to be a struggle, and you know we've got to, but we can't take our eye off the ball here. We cannot allow anybody's disappointment or attacks from the other side to obscure the reality of how much better the country is today than when we got in here. Remember when Joe Biden became president, not only was he dealing with this extraordinary, uh, you know, the, the, the vaccines hadn't been distributed yet. We were still in the midst of this extraordinary uh, public health crisis, but we had just had an attack on our government that was unprecedented. Um, you know, we had uh, a, 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 you know, a political party that was, then covered up the attack and tried to, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of legitimize this kind of radical politics. Biden didn't have a normal transition either because the president didn't allow, the former president didn't allow a normal transition. So when these guys came in, they were dealing with an unprecedented public health crisis, an unprecedented security and, and crisis in our democracy, um, and, an un, and an unprecedented um, what was the third thing? There was a third. The economy. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. And, uh, and the economy being in incredible recession. The level of crisis that Joe Biden faced, and remember when they went into the White House, right? They couldn't even meet with anybody. They were running this government without even being able to convene in-person meetings and having had no transition. And so like, let's just talk about the degree of difficulty that this team was given. It was unlike virtually anybody who's come into the White House and that's why I'm really proud of the Biden team and proud of where we are. And I think we have to be far more proud of our president and his achievements. And certainly Rob and I have been in what is perhaps an uncharacteristic role for the two of us. And we've been enormous cheerleaders of this administration and their achievements. And I think what part of we've been trying to do is to just create greater balance in the understanding in the public about how far we've come uh, and but we still have a long way to go, right? We're not out of the woods here. We've got enormous challenges ahead of us. Um, let me. Um, so Danny asked a question uh, about uh, Amy. I'll come back to you. Can either of you be more specific about how we sell the success of the economy to the public? Money, sound bites, blah blah blah. Let me just say is that that's not our job, right? Our job is to do what we're doing here: present data and facts. There is a massive campaign apparatus. That's out there testing language, and you know that that we feed into, right? We feed into that process. They have to then do all the things that we do in testing to sort of see how to sell this. 
But as Rob will tell you, I mean, the White House is very aware <laughs> of our belief that we have to be more aggressive about selling our achievements. And, I, and I'll give you just one example. When you see Joe Biden speak about the economy, the chart that's usually next to him is the chart showing job creation by month, right? That's our chart that came out of the work that Rob and I did. And they took that chart and use it now as the core visual, visual representation of their economic achievements. So we've been working very closely with the White House to help create better understandings and arguments for them. To, then, you know, we're like wholesalers, they're the retailers, right? They have to go take all this and put it into language that they feel comfortable with. Um, but I still think we've got a lot of work to do here. I don't, I, I think there's not just an, I'm very worried. I mean, I'm very, look, I'm incredibly optimistic about this election. I'd rather be us than them. But the thing that keeps me up at night is the stuff we're talking about today. We, we're underperforming uh, our, uh, with Republican in regard to the economy with Republicans, given our actual performance. And if you look at what Kevin McCarthy put out today as his three, the three top things in his new plan have to do with the economy and inflation. I mean, that's where they're going to close, and we have to, you know, get ahead of them in this effort. Let me say that you know when we first started talking to the White House about this, um, we had to argue <laughs> with senior White House staff and say, "Look at the data. Here's what the data show. You know, you are setting records that." Um, they were so immersed in trying to deal with all the crises that they had that they really didn't appreciate just how extraordinary the uh, recovery was in 2021. Um, and we had to go back again and again in order and did convince them to look, look in fact at the data um, that apparently their CEA was not giving them. Well, and I would put it a different way is that I, I and, and Rob is, is that, look, I, I think there's part of what was asked in the very first question is that the country's been down, you know, like we've been down, we got beat up. I mean, COVID was really hard. You know, the Trump presidency was really hard on a lot of people. The assault on our democracy was dispiriting and, extraordinary. You know, there are a lot of Americans who, who are deeply concerned about climate change and the struggles that are ahead of us. I mean, there are a lot of reasons to have been down and to have felt as if we weren't meeting the moment. And, and, I, and I think that part of the role that we've tried to play is to remind our family that we have met the moment, that we have, that the circumstances we were given were extraordinary. And that you know we have done a really good job, even if it doesn't always feel it every day, right? We have to remind ourselves about how far we've come, because I do think the country there's just a lot of negative sentiment in our politics now, and part of the way we combat negative sentiment is with data and with positive sentiment, right? And optimism and hope, and and I think that there's been too little of that, um, and and I think we're going to get there. I mean, I think I think Biden, you can see it. I mean, he's much more confident. And about and 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 proud, frankly, of what he got done. I really do think this final bill, the reconciliation bill, which I think was not given the proper name, the Inflation Reduction Act, because it sort of obscures the enormity of its investments in healthcare and and climate. Is that I think that bill was really important psychologically to the whole Democratic family. I think this was an enormous achievement. It may not have been everything we wanted, but when we look back twenty five years from now at the investments we're making in microchips and infrastructure and uh, climate and healthcare together, all of that, none of which, by the way, have happened, none of which are infecting people's understanding of the current economic moment, right? This is all stuff that will happen over the next 10 to 20 years. Man, have we done a lot of good here, right? I mean, this has been an amazing two years in the United States. Imagine what we could do with two more years, right? And that's part of what I hope everyone gets excited about which is really being honest about the enormity of the undertaking. We have to live more as Democrats with acknowledging the progress we've made and, and then talk about all the things we wanna do instead of living in this space all the time of all the things that didn't happen. And, and we have to get better about that. You know, We're not so good about that, I think, sometimes. Let me, Richard asked a really interesting question 
And Rob, I'd actually like your view in this too, it too is um, why are Republicans associated with economic success when they've actually been so, um, uh, they've actually had three consecutive presidents create recession um, and spiraling deficits, and they've struggled to perform when they've been in the White House, whereas we've had three consecutive Democratic presidents lead the economy to a much better place. Uh, why why are they getting why are they getting the benefit of the doubt here on economic issues? Well, um, this may sound strange, but I think one of the reasons is that they are identified um, with helping the rich. And there isn't there are a lot of people who believe that, the country prospers because uh, based on what rich people do and rich corporations. And rich corporations hire more people, that rich people generate not only jobs, but you know, a lot of spending. And so I think it, part of it is their identification with the rich and that and the fact that people would like to be rich. <laughs> and it is, you know, the democratic message is everyone is going to have um, a prosperous, fulfilling life. And the Republican percentage message is um, everybody can get rich. And I think that's very appealing psychologically, frankly. Uh, but whether that actually explains it or not, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I will tell you, let me, I, I think there's something very specific that happened just in the last few years, which is that, you know, we waged the campaign in 2020 as being the ones who were going to get us through COVID. And Donald Trump and the Republicans argued that we were the party of shutdown and um, and that we shut the economy down. And, and, you know, this is the entire argument DeSantis is making now in his reelection. It's going to be the core of his, if he runs for president, the core of his, of his presidential run, that he showed the courage to allow people to go out and do what they needed to do to make money for their families, and Democrats were the obstacle to that. I think this is a major issue for us. You know, I, I actually think this is a consequential hangover where we're still seen as sort of the party of shutdown and as having interfered with the ability of working people to make a living during a very difficult time. While also, I mean, I think people have a nuanced view of this, right? They believe that we led, us, led them through the pandemic, but also there was enormous cost to many during that time where we were, we overamped, you know, on, on it. And I think where this is really manifested has been with Hispanic voters. I think this to me is the main rationale for why Hispanic men have all of a sudden become a little loosened from the Democratic Party, because for a community of people who are deeply entrepreneurial, who tend to work in very small family-run businesses, um, who don't get a lot of, don't have as much access to the social safety net as many other Americans, that Democrats got on the wrong side of opportunity and, and better life issues. That's something I think we can easily fix. I mean, I'm actually really optimistic that this thing we're describing here is fixable, but we have to go fix it. <laughs> we have to actually identify it as an issue and then go address it. And I think that, you know, I'm, and that's why I'm actually relatively optimistic because by the way, this imbalance we're talking about didn't exist during the Clinton era and it didn't exist as intensely as during the Obama era. I think it's been very specific to the way that the country experienced COVID and the political messaging. If you go back and look at the Biden campaign, they didn't spend a lot of money on the economic piece of this. Mm -hmm. And the exit polls, for example, let me give you two incredible statistics that's in the one of my presentations. In the exit polls on the question, despite Trump having overseen this extraordinary recession and been the first president since Hoover to have had net job loss in his first watch, on the basic question of who do you think will be better for the economy, Trump beat Biden 51-39 in the election. Mm -hmm on the question of then what was the most important issue in the election? 41% said COVID and we won those voters three to one. That's how we won the election, right? Because it was the most important issue. 
And on the most important issue, we won those voters three to one. The second issue though at 28%, not that far below, was the economy. Trump won those voters four to one. Biden only won 19% of the voters who said the economy was the most important issue. And so there was already data and evidence in the election that for a lot of voters, they heard the shutdown Democrat message and felt that Democrats overamped and that we interfered with their economic lives in a profound way. And for many of those voters that continued with high gas prices, right? That sense of us not being on their side was then reinforced by high gas prices, in particular of the inflation things, the high gas prices really was the main psychological thing. So we've got work to do here. I mean, you know, in terms of if you're a struggling worker and your life was interrupted by COVID and then by inflation, you're wondering like, hey, are Democrats and Joe Biden really on my side? Well, we've got, that's why we got to make a kiss. That's why we're having this event here today. Let me see if there's other questions and I appreciate everybody taking the time. Richard, thank you for continuing to fight the good fight on Fox News. Nan asked, will this recording be available to participants? Yeah, it will be. It'll be on our website, barring any kind of technical problem uh, this afternoon. Um, and uh, I will include a lot of our economic work in that package when we put it up. Robert asked a, a really interesting question, Rob, that I'd like your speculation on is, does the public have any idea of the economic tailwinds that the recent, you know, these investments we're making will create for the economy in the next four to six years? And I will ask, you know, what's your expectation, Rob? When you, when you look forward, looking at the amount of spending we're talking about here, right? And it's gargantuan. Uh, we're already at, you know, full employment in essence, um, or close to it. The economic conditions are very strong right now. Even some of the estimates that there were a recession next year that, you know, we'll only get up to 4.4% unemployment, which is kind of, it's very mild recession, right? If that happens. What's your sense about what happens to the American economy over the next 10 years with these extraordinary public investments that we're about to make? Well, I think, um, I don't know about 10 years, but I can think through about five anyway. And um, uh, the fact is that those investments, the spending both in the Inflation Reduction Act and in the Infrastructure Act are why I'm, I'm still betting that we will not go into a recession because that spending hits next year, begins to hit next year, just as the real impact of the, in the higher interest rates um, are hitting the economy. Um, and so, you know, I think we're gonna have a very slow fourth quarter and a slow first and second quarter next year um, but not a recession. Uh, and um, as to the kind of longer view of it, look, this is, nations are the same, operate the same as corporations in that, and individuals, in that if you want to build wealth or build growth, you have to invest, um, you know, you, you can't build wealth as an individual without investing. Um, a company can't build profits without investing. And a country can't build growth without investing. And that's exactly what we're doing. And we're, we are uh, investing in um, areas that touch almost everyone, uh, like, you know, broadband and certainly on climate. Um, and on climate, you know, the, um, uh, I've looked into the provisions on electric vehicles in the Inflation Reduction Act. And, you know, there's the uh, importance of the automobile industry to this country is very great. Um, not only domestically, but also as a global trading power. Um, and China has gotten uh, a leg up on the electric vehicle market because they invested in it for years um, and gave large subsidies. And they're the largest producers. Although they can't produce a car, an electric car or any kind of car, 
that will pass safety checks in Europe or the United States. You know, there are no Chinese cars for sale in America. Uh, there are a lot of American cars for sale in China. Um, but the fact is they've had a policy to have a firm grip on the global market for electric vehicles. And we have finally responded. Um, and um, I was at a meeting with um, a number of Chinese business people in America, as well as um, Chinese who are working at the World Bank and the IMF. And <laughs> they're very unhappy about the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and I said to them, well, you know, there was a long period uh, where we didn't, we, we took no notice of your subsidies because you were a developing economy. Well, you're now a sophisticated economy and that requires a different response. Um, so I think these investments, um, you know, Biden is right. The infrastructure is the biggest infrastructure investment uh, since Eisenhower, uh, which set up not only the 1950s, but the 1960s. Um, and uh, I think it's very forward looking, very aggressive. And I think it will, um, the only way that we can raise the underlying growth rate of the country, which is what really drives rising incomes is by large scale investment in innovation. And that's what, that's what these, uh, these bills either encourage or actually do directly. And um, that was great, Rob. And um, two questions about Fed and raising interest rates. Nancy asks, how do we talk about the Fed policy of raising interest rates? And then Bill Andreessen, our old friend, asks, Rob, what's Rob's view of the impact of the Fed's policy of increasing interest rates? As you know, there have been some in our family who've been feeling like the Fed's going too hard. Uh, Larry Summers and others feel that they're, it's a little bit too late, right? What's your sense about what you're seeing with the Fed? Well, um, let me say Jerome Powell has not been a great chair. Um, he, um, he, you know, Janet Yellen, when she was chair, she was moving up interest rates in order to, the economist phrases, normalize interest rates, which is to say, have interest rates high enough so that when you hit a problem, you can cut them and have a big effect. Um, Powell reversed Yellen's policy under direct pressure from Trump. And the result was that when we hit a problem, the pandemic, we had to do $3 trillion in quantitative easing, which helped drive the inflation, um, because we couldn't cut interest rates because they were already zero. Um, and then I think he, he was a little late in beginning to raise interest rates. And now my concern is that he's gonna overshoot and raise them more than is necessary. Um, and, you know, he feels that he's getting blamed for the inflation and cause he knows he waited too long. Um, and so he's gonna make sure that this is, does not become a spirally, spirally inflation. I had, my own hope was that we would that he would pause after this latest one. I supported the three quarters of a, the last three quarters of a point increase. But then I, my own view was that we should pause for several months and wait and see uh, how much effect uh, these three increases have had. Um, they apparently do not intend to wait. Um, and so I think rates will probably go up another point to point and a half over the next six months, uh, that will be enough to slow the economy pretty, pretty dramatically. Um, though, as I said, you know, we got a lot of, we have a countervailing force 
and that's um, uh, all the investments in the Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I do think the good news is we're going to come out of this with low inflation. <laughs> um, the, the question is how much collateral damage will the economy take uh, as that happens? Um, and one last point, even if it does, the economy will be on a recovery, it should be on a recovery plane by 2024. Yeah, and I'll just say, Nancy, I just think one thing that's really important to keep pointing out is that one of the reasons the Fed is raising interest rates is because the economy was growing too fast for too long. I mean, the truth is we had, you know, we were growing, you know, we created 300,000 jobs last month the unemployment rate at three three and a half percent. I mean, we've never seen anything like that, or it's been very rare in post World War II America to see the level of job creation while the unemployment rate was so slow, was so low, and nominal wages have been unbelievably high. I mean, one of the things that makes this inflation different from the inflation of the '70s was that you know nominal wages have been very very high. I mean, last month, they're still running at about seven percent. So when inflation is 8.3%, it means that the difference is only 1%. It's not like nominal wages are at two and inflation's at 8.3. And I, and I do think this is a, another issue that I think we have to learn from about what's happened with the economic commentary in the media is when they talk about wages, they talk about real wages. But when they talk about inflation, they only talk about raw inflation, right? They don't, and, and meaning that, you know, there's a big difference between inflation at 8.3% and nominal wages being at 7% and nominal wages being at 2% right? in terms of the actual impact. And so let me explain this to you, right? So last month, you know, if you're in, with inflation at 8.3% and nominal wages at 7%, that means effectively your grocery bill went from $100 to $101, right? And, you know, and, and it wasn't $107. Right, it was. I mean, one hundred eight dollars. It wasn't eight percent more; it was one percent more. And we, I think, we have collectively done a bad job at explaining. And I, and it's and I have this view, which I I don't you know I don't know that I'm going to win this argument with my peers, but I have this view that one of the reasons why voters were so capable of moving away from inflation as a major issue is that to me, for people other than the people that drove a lot or gas, you know, if you were somebody who drove a lot in a rural area or an exurban area and you didn't have a fuel efficient car, the increase in gas prices was destabilizing to your economic life. There's just no question about it, right? This was a major event. Um, and if you, however, didn't drive a lot, you know, your grocery bill, again, only went up, you know, real wages were up until the war in Ukraine. I mean, people weren't falling behind. And what Rob went through today is that the American people did have not fallen behind. This is the central Republican argument, which is that the inflation that's happened has caused people to lose ground. That is false and wrong, right? And it is something that we have to rebut with unbelievable intensity. And they've gotten away with murder, frankly, on this. And, and I think that we've done, we've had a very bad collective response. I think inflation spooked us too. I think we got spooked and we were not able to really, I think, create a proper context in the way that we're trying to do today to say, you know, we have all this growth, all this progress and inflation is too high. Instead, we started talking about inflation too. And I will just tell you, if you read my writing and have listened to our things over the last you know, year, I have definitely been in the minority camp, camp about the way that we have talked about the economy as a party. I think we should not have led with inflation. I think making what we were doing was reinforcing the central Republican attack against us. Um, you know, they're very good at attacking us. We didn't need to internalize their attack. We needed to make the case that we're trying to make today that things are better and then let them introduce the issues around inflation, right? But that's not what we did. And there was an incredible internal party debate about this and what it would have made Biden seem out of touch with voters who are going through a struggle you know, I I, my, I am going to go on the record saying that I don't know that we handled this properly over the last year and a half, and that if we had done this in a different way, I think we would be in a little bit better shape with the public 
in their understanding about where the economy is. I'm not being critical. I'm just saying these were tough decisions. Um, and I understand why we did what we did, but I'm still kind of a dissenter from that decision. Let me also mention one, one kind of technical point that may make people feel a little better. One is, and that is, you know, when they announced the inflation rate, um, uh, they, they um, measure it by what are prices today as opposed to prices one year previous. Well, one year previous, the inflation was just beginning. And so as we move yeah. into the future, the base is gonna go up because the inflation was fairly high, um, you know, in um, uh, last January and February. So when we hit January and February, the rate they're going to announce is going to be much less. It's going to probably be between four and 5%. Um, and that's because, again, of what's happening at the base. There has been very little inflation, um, very moderate inflation over the last several months, um, mainly because so much of this was caused by OPEC. Um, and that is by oil prices, which is why it's a global phenomenon and not just a U.S. phenomenon. Um, and, you know, the inflation began in March 2021. And um, that and what happened then was uh, the world was beginning to recover. And OPEC said, you know, we lost a lot of money in 2020 because the price of oil crashed uh, during the pandemic, we're gonna make up for it. And so they didn't go back to the uh, exports from before the pandemic. They raised it from what it had been in 2020, but not by very much. And the result was a rapid run up in oil prices. Um, and, um, the reason things have been easing in the last couple of months is because the Biden administration spent the last six months talking to Saudi Arabia. They got Saudi Arabia to increase its production. Um, a real diplomatic triumph, frankly, which he hasn't gotten any credit for. Yeah, there's no question that the role that when the Russian war began the Russian invasion of Ukraine that exacerbated it. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I had forgotten my calculations on this, but something like 60 to 65 percent of the increase in gas prices happened after the, the war uh, began. And, you know, and so that was really those the spike in gas prices. I mean, inflation had been up, gas prices had come up. But when it we went through the roof here in the U.S. It was due to the Russians and, and OPEC. And, and I think that's why. The other people that I think are going to be really unhappy about these massive climate investments that we've made are going to be OPEC and the Russians. And I think that, you know, because what we've done and, and you know, we did an interview with Jigger Shaw, who's the uh, person at the Energy Department overseeing the spending of this much of this money. And he's going to uh, we're hoping to host him again before the election to give sort of an updated report on his work. But you know, what is amazing, what I hope everybody understands is that what just happened with this investment in clean technology and clean energy is that this will be seen, I think, as a tipping point in world history, that this will be a hinge point, because now every other country is going to have to match us. We've created, we've created this extraordinary spend. We're going to accelerate new technological creation. We're going to move our society rapidly along the adoption curve. And other countries are going to look at that and say, we have to keep up with the United States. We've got to, we can't let them get ahead of us. We also don't want to be embarrassed by them being ahead of us in, you know, EV production or any of these measures that we have. And so this is a, and as Jigger talked about when we hosted him, you know, we weren't starting at zero in 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 this. You know, the Biden Obama administration made massive investments in clean energy that helped create things like Tesla. We're seeing galloping adoption now of solar and wind. This is these are 
the results of investments that as a country we made a, a decade ago, by the way, investments that NDN called for in 2008 through a series of papers that we did around clean infrastructure. We were a leading, a thought leader in this space back in the last series of investments that we made in here. Rob was part of that work that we did. And what we're now seeing is, so it means that we're not starting from zero. Let's say if 10 is the best, we're starting at three or four. So these investments now are getting us from three to four to 10. It's not getting us from zero to three. And that's why this is so important, right? There was already tremendous momentum. There was critical, huge amounts of private capital had been moved in recent years. The adopt, we already are at a annual solar production capacity that could help us meet our global targets by 2050 already, right? So this is going to be an extraordinary time for the United States and the world. And I do think that when the world looks back at Joe Biden, the thing that he's going to be remembered for is going to be that is the climate investments and really being the guy who turned helped the world turn the corner in the battle against climate change. And I think the enormity of what's happened here is not at all well understood um, by uh, you know by the public. And it's really to me, I, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. Rob and I have been collaborating. It's possible that the climate package the series of investments that Biden's made around infrastructure and climate are the single most important thing that we've done as Democrats during the last 30 years of our time in power. And, and I think certainly we'll see that uh, play out. Rob, let me give you the closing. Why don't you bring it to a close? Any final closing thoughts? Um, well, I think we've, we've, we've covered everything, but I again, I just want to return to the last line of my piece, and um, imagine what Donald Trump would make of Biden's record if it were her, his record. Well, that's the message that Democrats should be uh, taking to voters right now. Um, this is a, an extraordinarily successful economic stewardship. Um, and we, but we'll only get credit for it if we claim it. <laughs> um, so I hope we do. It's a great win, Ann. Thanks, everybody. Got, we have some great events coming up in the next few months. Uh, look out, or next few weeks, I should say, look for some new announcements early next week. I'll also be scheduling my presentation called New Bluer Election. Uh, if you haven't seen it and you want to sort of do a deep dive, on the election. It's about a week old, but it's still pretty current. I mean, things haven't really changed that much. And I'll end with this is that, you know, I get asked all the time about the elections. Um, you know, we're in a competitive election now. Uh, I'd rather be us than them. And, you know, we've got to leave it all on the playing field here. And to me, one of the most important chess pieces we still have to move is we've got to lean into this economic conversation and win it with the Republicans. I think if we can do that, we're going to have a really successful midterm. And I think this is within our power to do. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Rob.